Hello, welcome back from your coffee break. Uh, between now and the coffee break, you'll be uh, stuck with uh, three Dutch presentations. First one is WireGuard in hardware description language. And it's actually 100 gigabit, so it's 100, but written decimal, so we're really targeting 100 gigabits. On an FPJ, FPJ NIC, a pure FPJ NIC, so no uh, ARM or RISC V uh, hard coded, so everything uh, hardware descriptor, uh, description language, except for maybe a RISC V. Um, I'm Leon Wustenberg. I'm working for Bright AI as an architect on this project, together with a small uh, remote team uh, on this project. I will tell you what WireGuard is, a short introduction, uh, why we think we have to put it on an FPJ, uh, and how we did that. Okay. So first, an introduction on WireGuard. WireGuard is a VPN protocol, or better, it's a network overlay that offers encryption and authentication. Uh, it's in the Linux kernel, it's state-of-the-art, it's written from scratch, it's formally verified to be uh, secure, uh, 4,000 lines of C code, uh, ported to Rust, uh, ported to Go, user space applications, uh, you can find it everywhere, iOS clients, uh, Android, it's everywhere, but it's in software. Uh, a few terms, uh, peer, and wire guard peer is a endpoint, or it's a host on the network, on the virtual network, and every peer can reach every other peer, so the network supports meshing. An endpoint is the public IP address, so the IP address where you can reach remote peers on the public internet. The endpoints are allowed to roam, so they can roam between 5G, Wi-Fi, they can switch external IP address, public IP address. And lastly, each peer has a set of allowed IP addresses, which, which can actually be a very large list of network address prefixes uh, within each tunnel. And multicasting is possible. I found out last week, actually. Um, very short introduction on the uh, stack. It's IP um, tunneled inside IP. It's encrypted with ChaCha20, authenticated with uh, Poly1305, put in UDP with a short WireGuard header. And this is the data packet. So we're talking about a few type of packets. This is the WireGuard Type 4 packet, which carries the encrypted data. So why WireGuard on an FPJ? Um, my answer would be, why not? Um, protocols are typically first um, written in a programming language because that's easy. But once a protocol is standardized, it makes perfect sense to run it on an FPJ because an FPJ is very power efficient. Um, I think we've done some calculations. Encrypting, authenticating one byte can be 50 times more efficient on an FPJ. Um, the other reason is the speed curve, the growth curve of Ethernet is still... Um, it's growing much faster than CPUs. It's flattening, like uh, CPUs, it's already flattening, but the curve is still steeper. So it makes sense to offload uh, the protocol. And also last month I found out that RIST, which is the reliable uh, internet stream transport protocol, it's a new protocol, actually al already ratified um, WireGuard inside their RIST protocol for video, professional video applications. And it's not a draft, it's actually a released spec. Um, so that was a quick introduction to WireGuard. WireGuard has uh, four types of packets. Four was the data packet, and type three, uh, one, two, three, 
is a packet where you set up a new session and, uh, well, actually rotate through the sessions. And the hard thing when you start moving um, a software protocol into hardware is how do you how do you do it? So first we studied the protocol and we found out there is a very nice uh, feature inside this protocol that rotates through the session. So while a session is up, you have a connection running. In the background, a new session is set up. It's being handshaked, handshaken, and at a certain point. Um, Atomically, you switch over to the new session, and that's a cyclic uh, process. Um, understanding that um, feature in the protocol helped us to um, design the solution. So, this is a, a sort of high-level overview of the protocol, what's involved. And the blue parts are actually the, the slow progress of keeping the sessions alive. And that's not really a real-time task. It's best effort. You can do it every minute, every two minutes. And the gray area boxes are the main functions in the data path. So we did with this notion um, and, it's, and a few numbers like these. Um, yeah, we, we could define the architecture. So 100 gigabits means um, wide buses, 512 bits wide. 250 megahertz is our lowest clock rate. We are multi -clock, uh, multiple clock domains. Uh, and it means we can have one packet header in each clock cycle, and that's, that's challenging. On the, on the slower part, so the session handshake, we have um, roughly one handshake per minute. And then it scales up with the number of pairs. So for 1,024 pairs, we have about 58 uh, milliseconds of budget per handshake. And with, th with these numbers in hand, this was the decision. So let's do the data path in RTL and the rest on a, vac on a risk v processor, maybe with some accelerator, or custom instructions, or a custom accelerator uh, next to the risk v uh, We evaluated a few um, risk v processors, also the IBEX, uh, very neat designs, eventually ended up with the VEX risk because of this flexibility, adding custom instructions, um, modifying the design, etc. So, during the proof of concept, we started with this design, and immediately, uh, well, we could we could use the pulp axi bar with ibex. We started with that, and then. We had to add the um, interconnect between the slow path, so the management, the blue path, and the data path, and we had to decouple it. And we used this feature of this rotating uh, session management. So by using each block in the design, having uh, three memories, or at least three memory areas, where we keep state for each session, uh, we can change the new session on the fly, configure the blocks, and once everything is configured in, the, in those blocks, we switch over atomically to the next session, so the RTL data path can continue 100 gigabits per second without losing any packets. So for most of the blocks, we have uh, threefold uh, memory usage current session, previous session, next session. And the previous session you have to keep because there could be packets coming in from the remote end because it didn't switch over at exactly the same time. Uh, the allowed IP sets is actually the most challenging part. Oh, okay. Let me first... 
describe this. So we started with facts risk and we were very, um, yeah, we, we liked it. And we found out, uh, it's written in Spinal HDL, or Charles is here. We found out it could help us enormously also building the data path. So I didn't have any experience um, programming Spinal HDL, but, but actually we found out it was very productive also setting up the data path. So the most uh, critical part is the allowed IP lookup, and I would like to spend a few words on that. Uh, allowed IP lookup means every clock cycle, there could be a new packet coming in on the data path. You would have to, um, well, depacketize, inspect the headers, and you typically have to look up the IP address which is in the path in the packet. And there's both the TX and RX path. So you have to do two lookups every cycle. Um, that's typically being done using a CAM memory, content addressable memory. And for this, uh, there are some algorithms that are typically binary tree based. In this case, we're using 2021 research paper that uses a sparse binary tree, uh, especially targeting uh, circuits. So the idea is, for every stage in the pipeline, you just check one bit of the address. So for a 32-bit IP address, you check only one bit and decide to go left or right. And at each stage, you're going to check if the network IP address matches the network prefix. Um, if it does, you descend down the tree, you remember the best, uh, the longest match, and you go down. So with 32 RAMs, B RAMs or U RAMs on, a, on an FPJ, within 32 stages you have your match. Within multiple thousands of network prefix addresses. Um, Logic for this circuit looks like this. It's actually, uh, it's not our invention. It's, it's on the internet, uh, quite nice a design. But to run it at high speeds, of course, there's, um, you have to do some pipelining and some matching. I'll, I'll, run, I'll throw in one tickle script for you. I know, I know you love them, but that's the Vivado logic level distribution. Uh, normally, you look at the slack of your design and you start uh, optimizing it. I also like to look at uh, logic level distribution, how many LUTs are in your uh, pipeline or in your combinational path. And that actually helped us to, to find the right mix uh, and speed for this design. So this was written in System Verilog initially. Uh, we ported it to Spinal HDL. Marek did that. He's also here. Uh, which allowed us to explore uh, several options of within the design much easier. And uh, after a few iterations, we ended up with uh, a double pipeline design like this. And if we want to go to higher speeds, we can just enable um, yeah, some parameters in the design to add extra pipelining. Um, for any FPJ that has a true dual port RAM, most of the high end FPJ devices do have it. Um, we can reach, um, I think we reach 400 megahertz and an ultra scale plus. Um, we went from 13 levels of uh, logic to four levels between the registers. And this means we can do two times 400 million lookups per second, 800 million lookups uh, per second. Uh, I would like to thank, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're building on external stuff. We're building on Spinal HDL extensively. We're building on the Corundum project from Alex Francis. He's not here, but um, if you're watching the show, <laughs> thank you. On the other side of uh, YouTube. And of course, um, all the great tools from the community. 
Also, we're using formal verification. I was not aware of this a few years ago. Uh, I think Matt Fan's video helped me on that. And also, it helped us enormously to, um, yeah, to speed up our uh, design process. The status is we're 75% uh, done. We open sourced uh, the project only a few weeks ago. Um, this is the repository. There's a frequently asked question, but where's the source code? This is the main repository. Uh, I have reserved it for all the documentation that we are going to add. Um, the actual source code is in separate uh, repositories, and they are listed in the README. So what do we have? A block with XE streaming interfaces that you can put in any open NIC or any other design. You can run uh, as a complete board solution Ethernet to PCI Express using Corundum kernel drivers. You can do Ethernet to Ethernet. And that's it. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> OK, we have time for a couple of questions. Down the front, where I just was. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I was wondering if the uh, handshaking process is uh, in uh, uh, TCP or if that also can also be done in UDP. Uh, WireGuard is uh, UDP based, so on um, so the outer pa packet is UDP packet. Okay, so the handshaking can then also be done in, in yeah, UDP. Yeah, so packet. WireGuard runs UDP over public uh, internets or IP uh, networks. Uh, the inner traffic can be any protocol, any IP-based protocol. Ah, okay. But so the handshake is always UDP. Okay. Oh, thanks. Yep. There we go. Uh, so uh, this is supported with uh, Vex Registry software, right? And so, uh, what is its compatibility with Litex now? Uh, because uh, can it run with Lite, ETH, and all that is part of the Litex ecosystem, its library? Can I use your design directly with this on an FPGA? Uh, so, the question is about Litex, right? Litex, yeah. Um, we're not using Litex. We built a complete. Um, infrastructure for the AXI memory map buses and the peripherals in Spinal HDL. Yeah. Uh, we're not using LightX to combine IPs. Uh, okay. Of course, you can break out this design and, and uh, attach it to LightX if you want, but we have not used it. And any reason that you went uh, to develop everything on your own yeah. uh, and not use? Because it already has a lot of things that you needed. Uh, uh, no, we did not. So we did reuse the Corundum project, which is a great project, PCI Express, OpenNIC. Uh, all the RTL is developed by us, except uh, Vex, Vex Risk, and of course all the library components in Spinal Lib, which are really perfect. Okay. Okay. So we, uh, we are reusing all the building blocks uh, from that. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask you to... Um, say something on using Spinal HTL versus Verilog, like where do you think it helps? Like where, where, where were the productivity gains? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it would make a perfect um, workshop or anything uh, talk about Spinal HTL. For me, I've worked with uh, VHDL, Verilog for 20 years. Um, I think you need a bit of background to go to, into Spinal HDL because you need an understanding of, of RTL and thinking in pipelining and stuff, so it helps. For me, the benefit is uh, writing less lines of code, but really powerful lines of code to mold your hardware design during... In pro so. When I'm at companies, I see them uh, edit block designs in, in Xilinx Vivado or putting systems together like QSYS in the past. And with Spinal AGL, you can do high-level abstractions uh, in a programming language. So you can build your top-level design really in a 
yeah, a really abstracted way, but zero cost abstractions. So it, it puts out, it, it gives us RTL code that is uh, as performant as optimized handwritten system fair log. So there, there's the benefit to me. Yeah. Hello. Um, the 100 gigabits per second is really impressive. Have, have you been able to test that? It says 75% complete. Yeah, the, the, the okay. okay, so what's not complete, so the complete data part is actually faster than 100 gigabit. Okay. Yeah? My, my Ethernet is limiting us. Okay, my question is actually, have you, you have a very deep pipeline. Have you measured the latency? Like yeah. Um, what's that? Latency is, uh, so, okay, latency, I know it's 390 clock cycles, deterministic. Uh, 300 of those clock cycles are in a 450 megahertz clock domain. So that's sub-microsecond, and then the rest of the clock cycles is in a 250 megahertz clock domain. So I think adding up will be one uh, microsecond latency. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so going back to, just following up to um, the earlier question, uh, what was the hardest thing you found in using Spinal HDL for a large design? And also, like, what were the, overall the whole project, what were the real pain points you hit? Mm. I had the luxury to have time to learn Spinal HDL. If you don't, do not have the time to learn it, then you will be put off by the learning curve. Uh, actually, in hindsight, the project runs for two, two and a half years. I have one time with it, I'm quite sure. But initially, it took me three months to get used to it. Yeah, yeah I was... Um, where am I going with that? Basically, we used Chisel, and it was the exact same experience. Yeah. Learning curve, but after that, epic productivity. Yeah. We, we love it now, so cool. All right, I think we've got to leave it there. We're yeah. running a bit late. Thank you, Leon. Cheers.